Thank you very much and welcome everybody to this Skill Me Up expert talk uh, on security best practices in the public cloud. My name is Dwayne Natwick. I am the speaker today uh, for this session. Uh, I spend my time as an author, trainer, as well as a product manager. Been in the industry for over 30 years. I have multiple Azure and 365 role-based certifications, as well as my CISSP and PMP certifications. I am a Microsoft certified trainer and I also uh, am a regional lead for the Microsoft certified trainer program. And you can find me on social media at the links provided on this slide. So for this session, we will be discussing uh, the many data challenges uh, that an organization faces in maintaining security and keeping data accessible to users. Uh, we'll talk about what should be accounted for to keep data accessible and available, options within a public cloud to accomplish maintaining the availability of data when it is needed. Uh, we will also go into key points for data confidentiality, integrity, and compliance, and discuss the public cloud services that can be used to protect this data. Uh, finally, we'll put this all together uh, to deliver a secure and accessible data environment to users. So before we go into the services and everything provided, let's set the foundation by going through the challenges that an organization faces in data protection. When an organization is building a security program to protect their users and information, they must take into account the two primary threats. They're both internal and external threats. Uh, internal threats are those threats from inside of the organization and external threats are those bad actors that are always attempting to access something uh, that are from outside of the organization. And improperly identifying and addressing internal and external threats can leave organizational data at risk. Uh, this can lead to data being exposed, compromised, and even lost if you get uh, involved in, in a threat that is ransomware where somebody just completely takes over and encrypts your data. It will have ne then negative effects, obviously, on your organization uh, from a financial basis. And in many cases, if you are a public company, there's regulatory and reputational damage that you could also incur. There are layers of protection that you need to take into account within a technology infrastructure. Uh, we, in security and in networking and, uh, and cloud technologies, talk about this as a defense in depth approach. And there are typically seven layers to building your security program and protecting your organizational data. And we'll go through these layers real quickly right now. Uh, physical security, uh, which includes your building security, exterior fences, concrete barriers and doors. And when you're dealing with Azure and public cloud, the provider is responsible for this. It's not something that, uh, that you as an organization are responsible for uh, when working with a cloud provider. However, if you have your own data center, you need to take all the, these physical security aspects into consideration. Uh, identity and access is properly designing your user group and resource access uh, that makes sure that access provided is only uh, what is needed to get the job done. Uh, this is typically you hear role-based access control and, uh, and least privilege access. That's where identity and access really comes into play. The Perimeter security layer includes the firewall where you set your port rules and access control lists that protects what transmits inbound and outbound. Uh, network security builds upon the perimeter security by segmenting your network with multiple virtual networks, uh, or as uh, if you're a network security person, you understand this as, as setting up different VLANs. And in public cloud, you generally are talking in terms of VNets, uh, but those are typical to segmenting a network on a switch uh, with 
utilizing VLAN technology. Uh, compute security includes the hardening of the host and the hypervisor, uh, which is uh, this it generally is a task provided by the cloud provider in a public hosting scenario. You don't, as an organization, have access to the host and hypervisor uh, in those types of data centers. But if you are, again, hosting in your own physical data center, you're going to need to take into account that, that host hardening and hypervisor hardening. Uh, what you need to worry about in terms of a infrastructure as a service aspect is, uh, har is hardening the operating systems and building a secure virtual machine baseline that can help to, uh, to maintain that compute security. At the application layer, uh, it's important to make sure that proper security is in place for APIs and that there's no developer backdoors left open before an application is put into production. Uh, if an application is accessing a database, uh, that connection to that database should be configured with the proper roles and allow only internal connections to that database to protect uh, the access to that data uh, from only that specific application and avoid any issues with the uh, with a bad actor getting into your environment and being able to uh, to go through a public IP address to that database. And then at the center of the graphic, you can see is our data, uh, which is ultimately what we're trying to protect as an organization. Uh, the last line of defense here is to make sure all data is encrypted at rest as well as in transit, and that data is properly classified for, for role-based access and that all encryption keys are protected and accessible when needed. To sum up this graphic and this slide, all of these layers should be continuously monitored for proper confidentiality, integrity, and availability, along with adherence to best practices and control effectiveness. To take this a step further, you can, and to help to think about how defense in depth works, it's good. I like to think about security and how it relates to, uh, to your house and to your residence. Uh, the functional use of the house is to protect your family and your possessions. In a technology infrastructure, your family is really your user environment and your organization. And the possessions are the data that belongs to that organization. Each layer of your home or cybersecurity is another area of protection for these possessions. And the more layers that you have for protection, the more difficult it is for threats to gain access and compromise the sanctity of your home. And as we relate to that, and we kind of take that to another level here, we can see, you know, when we're thinking about the building security and, uh, you know, our, in our house, we have our fence and doors, role-based access control is really our keys, who has access, who has keys, who has codes to our doors and uh, to get into our, into our facility. Uh, firewalls and port rules, again, uh, internal doors, you know, you may have your your teenage son or daughter with locks on their doors to keep your keep uh, you as parents out of there. So there's their there's their port rule on their firewall uh, with least privileged access to an internal environment. Uh, VLANs and uh, and TLS transmission, you have again separate rooms for every every document of your house. Um, the OS and host hardening, the locks on all your the locks on all your doors, APIs, putting deadbolts, having a secondary lock on your doors, uh, encryption and classification. You can take that to a level of having a lockbox for jewelry and your financial records, having that second level of security and uh, and vaulted uh, vaulted data uh, from that standpoint, and then monitoring is a key piece there as well uh, with alarm systems and generators to keep your power in your in your house up and running. Uh, and you know, maybe you know, a lot, lot of popularity in the in the ring doorbells to provide that uh, that understanding before you go to your door, who is there? Uh, that is you know another form of monitoring and can kind of 
coordinate and and um, and use that analogy of of that with with monitoring in a cyber defense environment. And as we talk about data protection within a public cloud environment, shared responsibility within a cloud environment is extremely important to understand. Uh, we've talked we talked about when we were talking about defense in depth, physical security as well as uh, as well as host hardening uh, being a responsibility of the of the public cloud provider, and that provides that sh the shared responsibility graphic provides those guidelines where public cloud and Microsoft Azure responsibility ends and organization responsibility begins. Uh, responsibility is different based on the different cloud models, and we'll kind of step through that in this graphic. Uh, and you know, and looking at looking at the organizational responsibility and the infrastructure control, they all are direct correlations when moving through the different delivery models of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, uh, as well as if you've got your own on-premise uh, environment. And, and the key point to understand here is that even though the graphic shows organizational responsibility in, uh, for example, uh, identity and directory infrastructure uh, or network controls, uh, you can still, it does not mean that in a public cloud environment, and we'll talk about Azure specifically as part of, within the realm of this presentation, um, Azure does have the ability to provide services for an organization and maintain that security and compliance, even though uh, it's not necessarily their responsibility to provide that, uh, that as a service within, say, a infrastructure as a service environment. Uh, in many cases, you know these services are available, but there's intervention that you need as a uh, as a consumer to turn on and configure those services. And we'll talk more about that as we go through this uh, presentation. Talk more about those services to protect your data, and we'll uh, and at the end we'll actually go and show some of those services and how to how to manage those within the Azure environment. Data responsibility, as you can see in the graphic, is the responsibility across all models of the, uh, as far as the organization is concerned. The customer is always responsible for setting up accounts and identities, uh, setting up devices, as well as the information and data. Uh, so no matter what service you're consuming or what model of service you're consuming, you need to be uh, cognizant that these are areas that you need to take into account as an organization. Uh, Azure does, though, provide encry you know, encryption at rest by default on all their storage accounts and encryption options for databases, uh, as well as there is encryption in transit that the organization needs to configure if it's sensitive data to configure it to not allow uh, HTTP type traffic, but only HTTPS traffic to transmit only using uh, TLS uh, protocols. And again, we'll we'll go through a little bit more of this as we go through this presentation a little bit further. There are two contributing factors to the effectiveness of a secure and accessible data infrastructure within the cloud and that's users and the organization. Uh, both have very different perspectives of what they need and how it would be provided. Uh, the user perspective is that they need access to the information and tools when required and in the simplest manner possible. That's generally a user perspective to things. Uh, the organization, however, is required to take into account the who, what, where, why, and how the user will access these resources while maintaining the confidentiality, integrity, and security of the organizational data. So these two, uh, these two forces are always to a degree in some sort of a conflict with each other. If an organization puts too many, puts too many controls in place, it makes it hard for a user to get to uh, get their, get to their data. They may find another way to get to their data. And then it starts creating an internal security threat of shadow IT uh, within your organization. Uh, and you need to make sure as an organization that you are taking those into account and making sure that where you're maintaining the availability and the retention and the secure access of that data 
and maintaining your compliance while also not creating an issue with users being able to access that data when they need it or creating some sort of lag or latency in accessing that data. So let's move into talking about the importance of data accessibility and availability in the cloud. When accessing data within the cloud, the availability of that data when it is needed is extremely important, particularly to the user environment, as we were saying in the previous slide. Uh, users want that flexibility to access this data, uh, potentially from multiple sources, and organizations must protect those sources from unauthorized access to that data. Uh, again, that organ the organization needs to ensure that the user that is attempting access to that data on a device is authorized to do so, and that a user only has the ability to access the data that is required for them to complete the task that is required for their job role. Azure provides services and settings that can assist in that accessibility and availability of data in the cloud. And we're gonna, now we're gonna move into those services and how uh, how those can help with that accessibility and availability of data. First of these services is identity management. Uh, key thing uh, to know is identity management is obviously extremely important in the context of accessibility to data. Uh, proper configuration for users, groups, and resources based on their role helps to decrease the vulnerabilities that data will be exposed to someone that is unauthorized to view that data. And that's both from a uh, internal and external threat aspect. Role-based access controls within Azure Active Directory, Active Directory domain services, as well as federated access services provide the definitions to what level of access will be provided to resources within Azure and the data that can be viewed. Uh, for an additional level of assurance, there is multi-factor authentication that should always be enabled for users to verify that they are who they say they are. Uh, MFA requires additional verification outside of a username and password because usernames and passwords can very easily be compromised. Uh, MFA, uh, if, you're familiar, if you're not familiar with it, will require a code or a message reply to be sent to a smartphone or an application or some type of biometric verification that is much more difficult to obtain by a bad actor. Uh, if they, they would need to have access to that device as well as have access to verifying, uh, you know, to the verification device that is created or, or that person's uh, finger or thumb if, if we're using fingerprint IDs. Uh, conditional access uh, can also be used to block access or require MFA uh, when certain conditions are met, such as a geographic location outside of a user's typical login location, an unauthorized app or device, uh, or devices that are viewed to be a high risk due to uh, missing security patches that have not been applied. Uh, privileged identity management can provide a user with elevated privileges to information under specific time-based parameters that will expire. Um, this, will, uh, this access is helpful for providing an auditor or an accountant that may only need to view sensitive data to complete a specific job task in a defined window of time. So all of these options put together can help to strengthen uh, the secure the security environment around identity management and decrease uh, the amounts of vulnerabilities and risks that are a concern to an organization regarding access to data. The next area we're gonna to talk to is uh, storage account protection. So within the Azure environment, as with any other cloud provider, storage accounts uh, will be where the largest percentage of data is kept and maintained. Uh, Azure storage accounts carry uh, availability uh, service level ag agreements of 99.99% when utilizing a read access geo redundant storage tier. Uh, and to take that for what, what we equate to four nines into uh, a time-based model, this equates to less than five minutes per month 
uh, or less than an hour per year of potential downtime. Uh, generally, if you break down how replication is handled by Azure, uh, the availability is actually much higher than that level because a file that is stored in a geo-redundant replication uh, setup provides three local copies within the primary data center, three additional copies in the geo-replicated data center. And therefore, there is, uh, if there is a hardware failure locally on a storage array, there are two additional local files to access a, that data. If the data center were to go offline completely, the geo-replicated data center can be used to access the data. So that four nines is really for the foundation and the basis of what Microsoft is willing to pay somebody for if they're down for five minutes, they'll pay five minutes of that service back to you uh, as a service credit. But really, if you are configuring properly with uh, proper re replication and proper geo redundancy for your storage account, uh, your storage accounts are really, your data is really very rare that two data that really two data centers are going to go down or two regions are going to go down entirely um so uh so it's important under, important to understand the difference of that you know you're really looking at uh, an always available if you're using a geo redundant storage tier uh, azure storage accounts by default are encrypted at rest uh, when you're setting up a storage account the encryption is turned on automatically and you would have to consciously say, I don't want to encrypt this data to disable that feature, uh, which obviously is a highly discouraged practice to go through um, unless you're just using image file, unless that particular storage account is just storing image files for your website, then that's not a big deal. But if it's carrying any kind of corporate data of any kind, uh, you should not uncheck that box in any case. Uh, encryption in transit is considered an option within an Azure storage account. Uh, when you're setting up the storage account, it does, al uh, does allow both uh, HTTP and HTTPS traffic uh, by default, uh, but it's a good practice, again, to select that HTTPS only for these accounts if they're going to store any sensitive data. To avoid unauthorized exposure of data, it's important when you're setting up a storage account to turn off anonymous access to storage containers and files. Uh, if temporary access to a file is needed, then you can create a shared access signature uh, and provide that access to users that require that access. Uh, these access links can also be set to expire uh, after a period of time to limit exposure if an unauthorized source gains access to that link. Uh, accidental deletion and retention of data should be taken into consideration when you're setting up a storage account as well. Uh, Azure storage accounts have a soft delete setting uh, that will retain a deleted file for up to a year. Therefore, uh, you are able to recover a file if a user accidentally deletes a file. An administrator can go in and, and recover that file. For retention of data based on business requirements, uh, blob storage accounts within Azure offer data lifecycle management settings that you can configure, uh, which assists in maintaining the availability of data to users based on when it, uh, when it needs to be accessed uh, while also controlling the cost of storage in the cloud subscription. Data that hasn't been accessed for over 30 days can be moved into a cool storage account automatically, and then after 90 days, they can move that uh, that to an archive storage account and maintain there for up to seven years to meet uh, any uh, U.S. federal or uh, or government uh, government entity requirements, whichever country you're you're located in and what's what's needed to be retained. Uh, U.S. federal tax requirements require you keep your keep your files and data uh, in uh, available for up to seven years. You have a seven year window to be audited, so it's important to to utilize that in your data lifecycle management. When you're utilizing databases within Azure, there are various options for both SQL and non-SQL services. Uh, we'll focus on SQL in the context of this presentation. Uh, 
key thing to take into to think about here is that Azure has three different deployment methods of SQL within their environment. And these are a SQL instance, SQL servers, and managed SQL databases. And these services go from uh, a typical IaaS type instance uh, of SQL uh, to a fully managed SQL database platform, respectively. So if you think about that, uh, that graphic of shared responsibility before, uh, SQL kind of falls into that IaaS as well as PaaS uh, level of services. If you do an IaaS where you stand up a server and put SQL licensing on it, you're in the IaaS standpoint. But if you're doing managed SQL database, you're now within that PaaS service. So Microsoft is now doing all the patching and OS hardening within that environment. There's definitely, there's a cost that goes along with that, that, you know, as you get into using more uh, SQL services and Azure services, you can, you can evaluate on your own time. That's out of the scope of this uh, presentation. But we'll highlight the managed SQL database when we're talking about uh, the next part of this slide. Uh, there are multiple options within the managed SQL database service uh, in Azure with different SLAs for each. So we're going to, we'll talk about that now. Uh, for databases that are critical to users and customers, Azure SQL database has a business critical or premium tier that you can configure with zone redundant deployments that provide a four and a half nine uh, type availability, which equates again to two minutes per month or less than 30 minutes per year of potential downtime. So you're looking at your environment being available at a very high level. Uh, in addition to that availability SLA, uh, that business critical tier with geo redundant replication has the recovery point objectives of five seconds for 100% of the deployed hours and a guaranteed recovery time objective of 30 seconds for 100% of deployed hours. So as long as you know, you're know you using that, if you're using business critical applications and you're deploying the Azure SQL database in, in a business critical tiered aspect, uh, you're looking at if there is a level of downtime, it's going to come back. You can recover it very quickly if you have it set to geo replication. Uh, and then to increase the availability and performance of databases, you can also deploy elastic pools. And elastic pools provide an additional way to scale database performance between multiple databases that may not have a static resource requirement, they're more of a dynamic, uh, a dynamic resource. You can pull those databases and utilize resources of other, of compute within that used by other databases for your database. Uh, all data in transit from a SQL database is sent through transport layer, layer security or TLS uh, to protect any data that's being delivered. So that is a pretty much, that is a default standard within a SQL database, uh, contrary to the storage account that we talked about in the previous slide where you had to select that HTTPS uh, to use TLS uh, by default and only TLS, uh, SQL databases provide that by default. Uh, unlike a storage account, encryption at rest is handled in a different manner uh, within SQL databases. Uh, there are multiple options to choose from and therefore encryption is not enabled by default and it is the organization's responsibility then to determine the best encryption method to support business and security requirements. Uh, there, uh, transport data encryption uh, utilizes centralized key management. You can use Azure Key Vault or a customer bring your own key type scenario. Uh, and then uh, there's a always encrypted setting to protect sensitive data within specific database columns, such as credit card information or other forms of personal identifiable information to avoid exposure. And this data then requires a certificate or key to be used by the viewer to make the information visible. Otherwise, it's masked to, uh, to a user that might access that data and they don't see that full credit card number or that full email address or personal, uh, personal identifiable information, social security number and such. Uh, there are additional security capabilities within SQL database that we'll cover in the next session, section of this presentation. 
Azure Advanced Threat Protection is another layer of cloud-based security that leverages Active Directory to identify, detect, and investigate threats, uh, compromised identities, and potential malicious insider actions. Uh, ATP monitors user behavior and can profile the activities to find anomalies to possible suspicious activities that may reveal a potential compromise of that data uh, of, of the user's credentials and may lead to a threat to data and resources. Uh, this can assist in reducing the attack surface through protecting user identities and maintaining accessibility to data from users that should have access. So up to this point, we've talked a lot about accessibility and availability of data. Let's now review how we can maintain confidentiality confidentiality, integrity, and compliance of that information that is now being accessed. Uh, in all organizations, there's a, there is sensitive information and data that if we're to get into the wrong hands could compromise the financial and reputational welfare of a business. Uh, therefore, it's important to make sure that this sensitive data is properly identified and protected and data that is confidential is only accessible to authorized individuals or groups to view. Uh, the integrity of data requires that data presented is accurate and that it is, has not been compromised in any way. And then having controls in place to monitor and manage both confidentiality and integrity of data assists in maintaining compliance to security and regulatory standards. So let's now discuss the services within Azure and the public cloud that can assist in maintaining this data confidentiality, integrity, and compliance. We talked back in availability about key manage about uh, Azure Key Vault. We we brought up very quickly when we were talking about SQL databases. The Key Vault is uh, is in Azure a way to provide a central location to store, access, and manage secrets. Uh, the secret uh, definition of a secret is a password, an access signature, an encryption key, an API key, or a web certificate that is needed for users, groups, or resources to access a service or, uh, or data. And to maintain the integrity of that data, the access and usage of these keys is monitored and can be viewed for anomalies and unauthorized access. The Key Vault then protects all of these secrets, and if any of the secrets are compromised, uh, you can rotate those keys and change these keys without the need to adjust any applications that rely on the keys for access. So it makes it a very easy, uh, easy change and easy rotation without having to reconfigure all your services within your environment uh, that are accessing the Key Vault. Azure Information Protection, it, uh, this provides a cloud-based service for data classification and labeling, uh, while also including rights management to protect sensitive data. Uh, having information protection enabled allows documents and emails to be sent to a classification manually, or the service can provide recommendations based on information found in a file, uh, the name of the file or the subject of the email. Uh, such as if you send something that says my uh, says my tax documents, it may classify that as confidential and then encrypt that uh, that email. Uh, Azure Azure Rights Management then uses uh, Azure Rights Management then uses labels and allows you to assign users and groups to the files and data based on their requirements to access this information. Uh, an example of this may, uh, you may allow the overall sales and marketing group to view sales information, but they're not able to edit or delete this information. So as we stated previously, uh, we were gonna go more into some, uh, some additional SQL database, avail uh, database protection uh, in addition to what we were talking about in terms of availability and accessibility in the previous slide. So, you know, as we stated, 
you know, SQL database does protect data accessibility through encryption and data at rest, but SQL database also provides services to protect that confidentiality, integrity, and compliance of database information. Uh, the first of these, as we uh, did gloss over a little bit in the previous slide, is dynamic data masking. Uh, setting, uh, this, uh, setting this up helps to limit sensitive data exposure to users that are not supposed to access that, such as social security numbers, as I stated before, credit card numbers and things like that. Uh, it will present the information to non-privileged users in a masked format without changing the information within the database. So users that have access to that information will see that information. If they don't have access uh, to see that sensitive information, you're going to see, you know, a uh, uh, a masked uh, a masked a presentation of that information, such as as the where the numbers would be for a social security number, those being X'd out. SQL database services can also be scheduled for regular vulnerability assessments to improve the overall database security by discovering and tracking uh, security issues. To improve data confidentiality, Azure SQL database has advanced capabilities for data discovery and classification that can be used uh, to classify and label sensitive data within the databases. Uh, this setting also provides monitoring and alerting for anomalous access to sensitive data while controlling access to and hardening security of databases that contain highly sensitive data. Uh, this can also contribute to meeting compliance to privacy and regulatory uh, standards requirements. Azure Policy is a service that allows you to assign rules to govern uh, the Azure subscription and resources. Uh, if you're assigning a policy to a subscription or resource group, that enforces compliance uh, when creating a new resource, and it will also audit existing resources against the policy for compliance and allow you to make the adjustments necessary to remediate those resources to comply to that policy. Uh, Azure Policy feeds governance and compliance information then into S Azure Security Center, and this information is gathered through assigned policies and initiative, so, uh, initiatives within the subscription or resource groups. Much of the data collected through activity logs in monitoring service logs, uh, policies from Azure Policy, as we stated in the last slide, are fed into Azure Security Center and to its dashboard, uh, such as uh, MFA, updates, policy compliance, as well as role-based access control roles. Uh, so the Security Center dashboard then can be used as a central source for policy and compliance of security controls. And Security Center is a central source to monitor and manage the best practices of security and compliance controls and view and adjust the levels of risk and vulnerability to your organization. So now that we've gone through uh, you know, the defense in depth strategy, all the layers of that strategy and the services that Azure can use to assist, how can this all be monitored and managed to deliver secure and accessible data? So as stated in the previ previous slides, Azure Security Center provides a central location for monitoring and managing your security posture. And Security Center provides a number of graphics and tools based on best practices that can assist you with reviewing policy and compliance to regulatory controls, uh, monitoring resources to best practice security controls, reviewing network topology and traffic for potential external threats, uh, as well as monitoring and alerting uh, using advanced threat analysis and global threat intelligence maps to uh, provide that information to you and alert uh, IT security staff of potential threats that may be coming into your environment. So we're going to finish up this session, this presentation by reviewing how to deliver secure and accessible data through the monitoring and management capabilities of Azure Security Center. We're going to walk through Security Center a little bit and show you how that works for uh, for going through going through and finding where you might have vulnerabilities.
I've navigated to my Azure portal here at portal.azure.com. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my security center. So the first thing you're going to see here right at the top of the dashboard is uh, the policy and compliance of, of uh, Security Center. And you can see here that we have some regulatory compliances that are, uh, are active and visualized right in here. Key point to, to uh, mention here is, is in the subscription coverage, you can see that I'm listed as fully covered. When you set up like uh, an Azure environment, initially you're going to come across as partially covered because the the basic subscription is a partially covered subscription. You'd have to enable uh, and upgrade to a standard uh, subscription tier for your Azure Security Center in order to get these regulatory compliance graphics within your environment, uh, as well as the networking and the threat protection as well. Uh, you can see within here, if I go into my regulatory compliance by clicking that graphic, you can see I have uh, I have five regulatory compliance uh, settings within the security center. Uh, four of these are standard. It's the the Azure uh, CIS, the PCI DSS, which is the the uh, like the uh, accounting and credit card standards within the United States, uh, ISO 27001, and then the SOC, uh, the SOC compliance standard. I have also added in a previous demo the uh, the UK uh, uh, standard health standard in here as well. But you can see here just within the Azure standard, you can look at the controls within your environment that are in scope within your environment. And you can see right now, I have two sets of controls that have red levels. So you can actually go in and see what the problem is. I do not have auditing set to on uh, within my database services. So I could go in and do uh, an adjustment to that. I do not have multi-factor authentication enabled for all privileged users. I don't have anything that is publicly facing within my environment, so I'm not worried about those. But if you were, uh, and if you had, you know, public websites and and public uh, base or people that were accessing applications remotely, uh, you might be concerned about these. Again, you can go into each one of these and you can see the controls and see where they're at. Uh, if you if ISO 27001 is an important standard to you, you can go in and you can see. Again, I have an access control. Uh, I have a couple controls within access control that needs need to be addressed and I can go and go right into drill down into what the issue is. And again, it's that MFA uh, issue, not having that enabled for everything. So that's a great way to understand your controls, especially around regulatory and auditable controls, get yourself prepared for a potential regulatory audit and as well as best practices within these controls to protect your data and have and maintain that accessibility to data, avoid issues to your data. Uh, another area here is your resource hygiene. So I have, again, four high severity recommendations within here. What, uh, three of these appear to be in my data and one in my, uh, my identity. Uh, and access resources. I can guess right now that my in my identity and access, it's MFA, uh, as we saw in the previous slide or in the previous uh, graphics. But in here, we could go right in here and we can see from the overview what I have in terms of possible issues within my environment. Um, you can see I did not turn on a vulnerability assessment for my SQL services. So I'm not logging and looking at and doing vulnerability scans on my databases. So what I can do right now is I can hit this quick fix button and I can enable that right away. And you can see here, I can select my database. I can remediate this issue right off the bat. And that's one of the nice things about Azure Security Center is for some of these services, you have the ability to go right in, make the change, make that adjustment. If you 
don't have that quick fix button and you go in here, you see Azure Active Directory Administrator should be provisioned. Uh, I can see what my remediation steps are and get to the documentation to do that. So Azure Security Center is a very powerful tool to help you to, uh, to look at your controls based on best practices and understand what needs to take place to, uh, to remediate those controls or take care of those right away. Here's my auditing. Again, that's a quick fix button. It's not a high severity, it's a medium severity control, but I can go in and take care of that uh, right off the bat. I think because it's working in my database right now, it's not allowing me to do that right away, but I can, but you again, have that quick fix button available uh, to fix that at a later time. I think because I'm vulnerability assessment still enabling and remediating that, I can't get to that quick fix right now. But Security Center, again, is a great central source of to look at your resources and understand your resources. Within the networking, there's a network map that you can look at uh, within this resource uh, within Azure Security Center that will map and show you where you have, uh, have resources that are It's not showing it right now, but sorry about that. You do have a, because I have none, I'm not seeing any uh, any services within here right now, but if you had a network environment where you're looking at your resources, you can see uh, within that environment where you might have exposed virtual machines that have port 80 exposed to the environments and things like that. So very, again, powerful centralized source for uh, for monitoring your security, making sure that your data is available. So to summarize in this session, uh, we discussed the challenges uh, that an organization faces for keeping data secure and accessible. We discussed what to account for when thinking about data accessibility and availability and the options within the Azure Public Cloud that can assist with those uh, with, with those capabilities. Uh, we talked again about then about data confidentiality, integrity, and compliance, and how Azure services provide options to protect sensitive data and maintain a secure and compliant environment. And then finally, we covered how to bring these services together and deliver a, and manage a secure and accessible data environment to users with, uh, and closed out with that demo of Azure Security Center and how you can utilize that as a centralized source for, uh, for accomplishing your security needs. Thanks for listening to this expert talk. Uh, we'll, uh, we have a little bit of time. If we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And look and see if there's anything in the chat. If anybody has a question and wants to unmute themselves, they can do that. Okay, I have a question. Is the recording going to be available? Yes, this session is being recorded and will be available on uh, Skill Me Up. Generally, when they go up for recording, you can find them in the new content areas, uh, or you can uh, search on the title of the session. Had somebody that had raised their hand. Uh, Baba Tunde, do you have a question? 
if you can't get yourself off a of mute, if you can put it in the, yep, yeah, there we go. Is there a general or standard comparison of the service metrics between security being turned on or off? Um, so I'm not sure if I, can you come off a of mute and explain that a little bit more or clarify what do you mean by general or standard comparison? comparison? Um, I mean, if you don't have uh, have your you know certain security areas turned off, I mean, if you have certain security capabilities turned off, what you're going to see in Azure Security Center is you're going to see a lot of warnings uh, because you're going to it's going to say that controls aren't enabled, you're not monitoring this, you're not monitoring that. Um, so, uh, so really, what you're going to going to see is you know you're going to get a lot of results of vulnerabilities that you have in your environment um you know the you know from a service metric standpoint in terms of availability um there really isn't you know you what microsoft publishes uh in terms of their availability of their services it is their availability of services but if you're uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was going that route in terms of performance trade-off um, between performance and security. Um, there, there really isn't. I mean, you know, uh, one of the things and one of the reasons why there is um, not encryption specific uh, in a SQL database turned on does have to do with a performance issue. If you're encrypting, you know, doing always encrypted uh, within a uh, within a database versus application encryption, you may have a performance um, a performance latency in accessing that data. If that if that and if that data needs to be accessed in a fast manner, say say you're using that database using a database for uh, for a uh, for a for web for inventory of a of a uh, e-commerce website, you're not going to want to encrypt that data probably because users are going to want to access that they don't want to lag in that in that inventory information showing up right away so uh, so there is a little bit of a trade-off depending on the services and that's where where it's good to find the you know use security center again to find where those high severity type controls are in place make sure you have those high severity controls in place and then balance out you know in terms of the medium and the low um, what if if I put that control in place, is it going to uh, lower the performance or create an issue in terms of my user environment? So so those are some that's a really good question and some things that you, you know some things to think about. You know you may all of the controls and all of the alerts that you might get in Security Center may not pertain to your environment, and you need to need to balance that out, take that into account. Now if you're a regulatory environment that is going to get uh, get audited on say uh, in the United States, a healthcare environment that needs, that has HIPAA controls, or uh, like I said, ISO 27001 uh, that, and you aren't, and you're deciding that you aren't going to put those controls in place and you get audited, you might lose your, lose your compliance to that standard. If you're just looking at those standards and looking at, uh, at trying to build yourself compliance within that standard, you may, uh, look at some trade-offs uh, one way or another to uh, to make sure that you're uh, that you're balancing that user versus organization uh, tug of war that I spoke about in the slides. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? Does anybody else have anything? Got a few more minutes before the top of the hour.
Okay, if you don't want to take yourself off mute and you want to type it in the chat, I'll be happy to answer it. All right, doesn't look like we have any more questions coming through, so uh, I'll uh, wrap things up here. Again, my name is Dwayne Natwick. Feel free to reach out uh, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, any type of social media. Uh, as I as I showed in the beginning of the deck, I uh, also have a, a blog site that I utilize. If you find me on LinkedIn, you can find the link to that as well as on Twitter. Uh, what I uh, want to just thank everybody for attending today, and I appreciate your time and hopefully provide you with some valuable information that you can take forward and use uh, in your uh, organization. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm.